Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, what I'm going to do is count down 10 common Linux issues and what to do about them. In this video, I'm going to cover all kinds of things from Wi-Fi not working, you're unable to log into SSH, your system's slow. There's going to be all kinds of things on this list that'll be valuable to you guys, and you'll probably run into at least a few of these on my list. Now, before I get into my list, I do need to take a moment and mention the sponsor for today's video. And that sponsor is Sendio, the makers of ThinLink. ThinLink is a remote desktop solution that enables you to access a Linux desktop from anywhere. ThinLink can be used in a setup for one or a few users, but it can also support thousands of users in enterprise environments, providing remote access to high-demanding OpenGL applications running on a centralized server. ThinLink is easy to set up and the performance is great. In fact, ThinLink includes admin tools for system administrators to make managing this product even easier. Part of what makes ThinLink awesome is that it combines the best open source components out there to provide a pure Linux experience. But it's not just about Linux. Clients are available for Windows and Mac OS as well. So even if you don't use Linux as your daily driver, you can still use a Linux desktop anytime you want. And ThinLink is developed by Sendio in Sweden, one of the oldest Linux-centric companies in the world. And these guys know what they're doing as it's developed by the same team behind Tiger VNC and No VNC. So check out ThinLink. It's my favorite remote desktop solution, and if you visit the URL that you see on the screen, then you'll let them know that you heard about them from Learn Linux TV. But not only that, you could test it out for yourself and see why it's awesome. You could set it up on a virtual machine, a cloud instance, or perhaps your own computer. And a full version is available for up to 10 concurrent users for free. So check out ThinLink. Now with all of that out of the way, it's time to dive in. So let's check out my list of 10 common Linux problems and what to do about them. And the first is what to do when a user is unable to log into a server via SSH. They come to your desk, they tell you that they're trying to access the server via SSH and they're not able to get in. And what's interesting about this is when you have issues with SSH, it's not always obvious what the underlying problem is. Here's what you do about it. The first thing that I would do is connect to the server via SSH. If you're able to do that, then at least you know that SSH is working in the first place, so you can rule that out at least. But assuming the problem isn't something like that, and that this particular user is the only one that's experiencing a problem, here's what you can do. What I recommend is tailing the authentication logs. Depending on your distribution, this might be in a different file. It could be slash var slash log slash auth dot log, for example. It might be var log secure. Again, it depends on your distribution. Once you know what log file logs SSH failures, then tail that log. Use tail dash f and then the path to the log file and the name of the log file, and then tell the user to go ahead and try again. Once they do, you'll see that the log is updating right before your eyes because Dash F is follow mode, you're following the log file, and anything that's newly written to the log will show up on your screen, which also means if the user is trying to log into the server, you'll see the error message in the logs right away. It might say that there's a problem with their SSH key, that they're not in the allowed users list or something, who knows, but whatever it is, it should be made apparent what's going on once you check the log file. My next tip is for those of you that are running Linux on a workstation, a desktop, or a laptop. And it's especially for those of you that use GNOME as your desktop environment of choice. If you haven't changed the desktop environment, chances are you're probably running GNOME. Ubuntu uses GNOME as its default desktop environment. Fedora, the same thing, you get the idea. Now, if your system is running very sluggish, there's one thing that I think people often overlook as the underlying cause, tracker. Now the word tracker sounds really bad, doesn't it? Who's tracking you and why are they tracking you? No, 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 I'm not talking about anything like that. The application is named Tracker. That's what I'm referring to, an application or service named Tracker. It's part of the GNOME desktop. What it does is it scans files on your system to allow you to find them faster. It's an indexing service, basically, and it makes all of your searches faster on the GNOME desktop. So it's a good thing to have. But unfortunately, where this often falls down is when you have network shares. For example, let's say you have a big folder full of movies and music and things, and you mount that share to your desktop. Guess what Tracker is going to do? It's going to index 
everything. And I do mean everything. In my experience, sometimes it's literally indexing the entirety of your NAS, and you'll have no idea that this is happening. So your system just runs slow, and then some people think that GNOME is bloated when that's never been true. It's a very fast and efficient desktop. But sometimes the reason why it's sluggish is literally due to Tracker. But there is a very easy solution for how to deal with this. All you have to do is create a brand new file at the root of your file share. What you'll name this file is .trackerignore, just like you see on the screen right now. If you create this file, even if it's empty, then you'll stop it from scanning that directory. So you should definitely include this in your file shares, for example, unless you do want Tracker to scan those as well. If you have a file share that only has a handful of files, it's not going to take that much time. But if you're like me and you have like 10,000 photos, well, it's going to take a minute, so you'll probably want to disable Tracker and not have this take effect. Anytime Tracker is working on your computer, it's taking a lot of resources, resources away from what you're doing. But the thing is, once Tracker finishes indexing your system, it doesn't really impact performance all that much afterwards. If you save a new file in your home directory, it probably takes it a few seconds to index it. But again, the problem comes when you have a file share or a massive folder with files in it that for some reason it has to scan repeatedly. Again, NFS or Samba shares are a very good example of this. And also, again, it's not going to tell you when it's doing this. So what this will look like is your system is running slow for no apparent reason. Just create that .tracker ignore file in the root of your file shares that you don't want indexed and watch how fast your machine happens to be after that point. It's crazy. Now this next problem is very, very strange. It's not strange once you know the root cause of this, but at first, it's going to be odd. Imagine that you can't save a file in your home directory or any other file system because it tells you that the disk is full. But when you check, the disk isn't full. You have plenty of hard drive space free. So why on earth is your computer telling you that you're out of space when you're clearly not? Now, in this case, when you run a command like df-h, it's going to show you that you have space free. So that's why people will be confused by this. But try df-i instead. And what that's going to do is show you how many inodes you're using, or how many inodes you have free. The thing is, a Linux installation has a limited number of inodes. Every file or object is going to take up one of these inodes. So that does mean you have a finite number of files you can store on a Linux system. But the thing is, the number of files that you can store on a Linux file system is so crazy high that you'd have to work really, really hard to hit this number. Nobody out there that has a massive movie collection or music collection is going to possibly hit this really large number. It's astronomical compared to how many files you'd have to save on your hard drive to hit this number. But if you do hit this number, it's probably not your fault, at least not directly. It could be an application's fault. Maybe it's creating a file over and over again. If it's restarting over and over again and refreshing its log or creating a new log file over and over again, you should notice that one directory has a ridiculous number of files in it. And this is especially true if you run a mail server. If you have an issue where mail is being caught up and not leaving the server, then the outbox is just going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And then at that point, it's going to tell you that your hard drive is full, even though it technically isn't. You just ran out of inodes. Now, the solution to this depends on what the underlying problem is, but the answer is inodes usually. So I wanted to let you know about that. So that way you could file that in your memory banks in case this situation comes up. And I think it will eventually. For the next issue, Wi-Fi isn't working. I can't access Wi-Fi. What should I do? This is really common, and I don't really understand why, because Linux distributions offer live mode. You could use live mode to demo the distribution before you install it. So if Wi-Fi doesn't work, for example, then you shouldn't have installed Linux in the first place and replaced your current operating system, because if it's not working, you shouldn't install it. But it seems like many people don't check this before they install Linux, and they end up with Wi-Fi that doesn't work. And this usually comes down to hardware compatibility. Since drivers are built into the Linux distribution itself, usually you'll have drivers for all the noteworthy Wi-Fi cards out there. Chances are it'll work just fine, except for those of you where it doesn't. And what you should do about this is replace your Wi-Fi card, seriously. But to be fair, the appropriate answer here that most of you are looking for, or the answer I should give you, is to tell you to find the driver, compile it, and install it because some Wi-Fi cards just don't contribute upstream to the Linux kernel or distributions. 
So the distributions have no way of getting that working, or it could be a licensing restriction and you need a driver. You could go and download that driver, but that's not a good idea, despite what anyone will tell you. Anytime you update your Linux distribution, you're going to have to go through this process over and over and over again. And you might forget the process sometime down the road. You might find yourself upgrading a Linux distribution to a newer version just to find Wi-Fi broke again. How did you install the Wi-Fi driver? Oh, right, you don't remember because that was a year ago. Now, sure, you could write down notes, but replacing the Wi-Fi card is always the easiest way to go. If you replace the Wi-Fi card in your laptop, for example, then you'll always be sure you have a supported Wi-Fi card that's known to work with Linux, and then you can just pitch the one that Dell gave you, for example, because it's not compatible with Linux, or put it in a drawer somewhere. You could usually find Intel Wi-Fi cards for less than 15 US dollars on eBay. So I don't really understand why so many people out there are trying and trying for weeks on end to get a Wi-Fi card to work when all they had to do was just pop open the bottom cover, swap the Wi-Fi card, and call it a day. Now, one potential issue you might run into, and it's something you might want to check before you replace the Wi-Fi card, is whether or not your computer manufacturer allows you to. And I'm not just talking about the warranty here. Sometimes a manufacturer might lock the computer, not allow it to boot, if you install a Wi-Fi card that didn't come with it. And that's a really stupid practice that every manufacturer out there should instantly stop doing because that helps nobody. But it is the case. I've seen this on some HP laptops. I've seen this on some Lenovo laptops. Just understand if yours is one of them. And if it's not, then replacing the Wi-Fi card is literally always the best solution to fix Wi-Fi problems on Linux. Get yourself an Intel Wi-Fi card, you'll generally have no problems whatsoever. If you are still not comfortable opening up your computer to replace the Wi-Fi card, even though it is one of the easier things to replace, you could consider a Wi-Fi card, a USB Wi-Fi card from Think Penguin. They're not a sponsor. In fact, I don't think I've ever spoken to them except to probably order one for myself. So this isn't a sponsored segment or anything like that, but they make Wi-Fi cards that are born to run on Linux. So if you plug in a Think Penguin USB Wi-Fi adapter, it's just going to work. And since they're low profile, you can leave it in your computer. It's not going to take up all that much space. So that might be a solution, especially if your manufacturer doesn't allow you to change the one inside the computer. The next common Linux issue that you might run into is when you go to open an application in GNOME, but it doesn't open. So you click on it again. Maybe you didn't click on it good enough or something like that, but it still doesn't open. By the third time, you'll probably realize that it's not you that's the problem. It's literally just not opening. And this is really simple to fix, by the way. All you have to do in GNOME, because that's where this happens, is go into settings, go to your language settings, and make sure that your language settings are set appropriately. I'm going to show some B-roll on the screen right now that's going to show you the process. But when you don't have the locale settings in GNOME set up properly, then the application might be confused it can't open. But once you set the locale, log out, log in, then applications will open again. This is somewhat common if you hand roll a distribution. Most of the distributions out there that ship with GNOME will already have this taken care of for you. But if you're running something like Arch Linux or one of the other distributions that are more do-it-yourself, you'll be way more likely to run into this. And to save you some time, I just wanted to give you an answer. So all you have to do is go into settings, set the locale, log out, log in, you're good to go. Next, your games are running very poorly or maybe they're not even running at all. What gives? And this is one of the things that people run into first when it comes to Linux, especially those of you that have an NVIDIA card, which is who I'm talking about here. Normally, your video card driver is going to be built into your distribution, so you shouldn't have to do anything in order to get your video card up and running. But NVIDIA has a proprietary driver. They don't upstream that to Linux, so there's a bit of a problem here. They kind of silo this, and as a result of this, you have to install the NVIDIA driver yourself manually. But thankfully, most distributions make this pretty easy nowadays. For example, let's take Ubuntu into consideration. Ubuntu has a dedicated application just for drivers. In fact, Linux Mint also has something like this available. You could use this application to scan your system, and if a proprietary driver is available for any piece of hardware, it'll give you an option to install it. And it's pretty easy, you click on it, and then, well, you install it. If you see something here for your NVIDIA card, then that's probably your issue. Since the NVIDIA proprietary driver is not installed by default on most distributions, this is going to be something that you'll have to do after installation. 
But once you do set up the NVIDIA driver and then reboot, then your game should run just fine. So install your NVIDIA driver because that might be the reason why your games are running so poorly. Now the next one is very, very strange. It's so strange that I can't even explain the problem to you. If your Linux system is behaving erratically, strangely, and you just don't really know what's going on, could be some random seeming error messages or just some shenanigans going on and you really can't explain it, but it just doesn't seem like it's running all that well. Now, I can't give you an actual symptom here because it differs depending on the hardware, but what I'm talking about are memory issues. If you have defective memory, Linux doesn't handle that well. Actually, no operating system handles that well, but if you have defective memory chips, your computer might run just fine otherwise, but have some strange little quirks going on, you might have defective memory. Now, before anybody says that everything was working fine on Windows and now doesn't work on Linux, then I'm going to stop you right there because that doesn't mean anything. Every operating system handles memory issues differently. The way that you see memory issues in Linux is going to behave differently than Windows and so on. So working in one situation, not working in this one, doesn't really mean much. What I recommend you do is run Memtest86. It's a free utility, and all you have to do is run it for a few hours just to test your memory on your physical systems. That's what I'm referring to here, your physical systems. And it'll report any errors that you might have. It'll let you know if you have a defective stick of RAM. If you do, there's your problem. You have bad RAM. And for a lot of people, they might have thought that everything was working fine on Windows. Maybe it was fine, maybe it wasn't, or maybe Windows is good at hiding issues. Linux, not so much. But memory issues happen all the time. And especially if you buy a used system, you should run Memtest86 on it just to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Number eight, are you dealing with a software problem or a hardware problem? Now, to be fair, hardware issues are usually pretty obvious. For example, if you bump your monitor and crack it, there's a hardware issue. You don't need to do any diagnosing to find out what's going on with your monitor. If there's a big crack in it, you know what's going on. Obviously, it's a hardware issue, but sometimes you don't really know for sure. It could be a software issue or a hardware issue, and here's how you can tell the difference. Run live media. By running a distribution in live mode by downloading the ISO image, creating bootable media, and running off of that, you could find out if your problem persists in that environment or if it only happens in your installed environment. If the problem does not happen on a live instance, for example, then that might mean that you have a configuration issue. You have something to fix in the settings when it comes to your distribution. But if you have the same problem with live media, then you know it's not really related to your installation. There must be something else that's causing it, and now it's starting to look more like there's a hardware issue. Now, it's impossible for me to give you a full list of symptoms here because when it comes to hardware and software problems, that's very generic. I don't know what kinds of hardware problems, what kinds of software problems you might be running into. But what I do know is that live media is something you should always have around. It helps you troubleshoot things by narrowing down where the problem space is. You can find out if it's an issue with your distribution. Maybe something works fine in another distribution. Maybe you have a problem that doesn't work regardless of what operating system or distribution you use. In that case, you have a hardware problem. Or sometimes you need to get into your system in an emergency basis. Maybe you can't boot the system. In that case, a live media image is going to be great because you could boot the computer even if you know something failed and maybe get some files off of it before you pitch it. It's a good thing to have live media available and you always should because it helps you narrow things down. Now it's time for number nine. You should ditch DisplayLink. DisplayLink is a popular technology for USB hubs and docking stations, specifically docking stations, because that's where this comes up the most often. But what exactly is DisplayLink? DisplayLink is technology that powers some of the docking stations out there. And by docking station, I'm referring to the USB-C docking stations or USB-3 docking stations that you might have seen. And maybe you own one. Now the thing is, DisplayLink is very problematic and it has no reason to exist whatsoever. Seriously. DisplayLink, technically, is going to bridge the gap between your operating system and the docking station, allowing things like display and networking and keyboards and whatever else that you have connected to your docking station communicate with your computer to transform your laptop, for example, into a desktop. I mean, that's what a docking station aims to do. But the thing is, 
Operating systems know how to interface with docking stations by themselves. Every operating system, I don't care if it's Windows, Mac OS, and yes, Linux, they have 100, yes, 100% support for these docking stations. It's built right into the operating system. And when it comes to Linux, you don't have to install anything. If you have a standard USB-C docking station, you have to install nothing. Windows, nothing. Nothing to install there, nothing to install on Mac OS. A true docking station, you plug it in, you're done. The minute you have to install something to get it working, well, there's a problem because you should never have to do that. And because of DisplayLink existing and being such an unnecessary technology, it causes all kinds of problems. For example, when it comes to Linux, it does support Linux. So yes, you can get these to work on Linux, but only very specific distributions. And when you update your system, your docking station might just stop working. And the reason for this is because the DisplayLink driver is required in order to allow this to work with your device, which is interesting because when it comes to docking stations, on any operating system, like I mentioned, no driver is required at all. You don't have to install anything. It makes things more complicated. Just get a standard USB-C docking station and you won't have any problem. Now for the last one on my list, we're going to talk about hardware compatibility. More specifically, we're going to talk about what to do when your hardware doesn't seem that compatible. Maybe you try a Linux distribution and your network card, video card, or some other device just doesn't work. Now it could be the case that you have a distribution that's not compatible with your hardware, but more often than not, the problem is that you're using too old of a Linux kernel. Seriously. Because of the fact that the Linux kernel has most of the drivers that Linux needs built right in, if you're using an older kernel, then your older kernel can't possibly understand new hardware, hardware that came out after the kernel did. So imagine if you have a motherboard that came out you know, yesterday, and you're using a Linux kernel from a year ago. That Linux kernel has no way of knowing that hardware was going to be created in the future, so it's not going to work with it. Now, the biggest problem here is that most likely you didn't choose which Linux kernel you're using. That was chosen for you by the distribution. And some distributions, they ship with an older kernel. So what you'll wanna do if you're having hardware compatibility issues is just understand how new your hardware is and how old your Linux kernel is. Now you might not know what constitutes a new Linux kernel and an old one. One metric is when your distribution came out. If you're using a distribution that came out a few years ago, well, the kernel probably did too. And two distributions you can consider checking out that might help you in this case is Ubuntu or Pop! OS. Both of them have really good compatibility with hardware. So if you're using a different distribution, you could consider one of those. But more often than not, if you're using an older Linux kernel, then you might have some hardware compatibility issues to diagnose. And that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this list of common Linux issues and their fixes, and I hope at least one of them has helped you out. And if it did, please consider clicking the like button to let YouTube know that you like this video. I would really appreciate it. In the meantime, I have some awesome videos coming, so please subscribe to Learn Linux TV for the latest in Linux, and I'll see you in the next video.